Hello and welcome to the latest edition of our podcast series. My name is Ian Kennelly and I am historian in residence with Westmead County Council. Today we are going to talk about Roscommon. Of course, there are many crossovers between Roscommon and Westmead, particularly through areas such as Athlone. My guest is John Burke, MA, PhD, who is a graduate of the National University of Ireland at Galway. As well as having authored numerous articles on the period 1900 to 1923, he has published two books dedicated to the Irish Revolutionary Period. At Law 1900 to 1923, Politics, Revolution and Civil War, and Roscommon, The Irish Revolution 1912 to 1923, which was very recently published by the Four Courts Press. Right, John. The first thing I'm going to ask you about is the aftermath of the 1916 rising in Roscommon, the growth of Sinn Féin up to the 1918 general election. But I'm thinking probably the best place to start might be the 1917 by election. Can you tell us about that and its importance nationally as well as locally? Right. Uh, well, I suppose by February 1917, when the Sinn Féin backed uh, eventual winner Count George Noble Plunkett took a seat that was safe for 20 plus years, um, what really was happening there was, was uh, I suppose, the end result of a whole series of of um, blows to people's political faith in constitutional nationalism. Now, Easter 1916, obviously, the previous April had to some extent, um, a, I suppose, amplified pre-existing disquiet. And that disquiet in Roscommon and in a lot of Western counties very often uh, centered around land and the inability of those who wanted it and those who thought they deserved it to get a fair portion of it. Well, the Irish Parliamentary Party had um, made built its success on land from Charles Stuart Parnell in the late 19th century all the way up, they understood that to win politics, uh, political support in places like Roscommon, you needed to be all about the land. And by 1917, the by-election, what we had there was probably about three years of the Irish Parliamentary Party forgetting that. Now, the third term rule bill came in in 1912. People were of the opinion that it came in quickly, that um, the land to be dealt with by the Dublin Parliament. The First World War came along, that became a a further, uh, I suppose, hope rather than approximate one. And you know, people like John P. Hayden, the South West Common MP, telling people, look, at it, just be patient, we'll get you the land, but we need the Parliament first, the war prolonged. Then various other issues started to tack on, from food prices to, to, to the price of fuel. And then 1916 Easter, of course, we had a, a very, I suppose, limited geographical uh, rising in places like Dublin. Primarily, of course, the Enniscorthy and parts of Meath and Galway and what have you. But in what's common, one of the big problems was that it was probably the quietest county in the country. But the British Army response, the Crown Forces response, put it somewhere around fifth or sixth in arrests. So for people who were loyal, in inverted commas, or at least not prone to violent expression of their political desires, at least not outside of land, I'd say. Uh, what you had there was uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. So if they didn't participate, uh, they could be said that they were trying to force the British out. If they did participate, they then had to deal, unfortunately, with a uh, similar reaction, shall we say, from the British. The British were being profligate in their, I suppose, their um, uh, very heavy handedness. Now that pushed people a little further away from the Irish Parliamentary Party also, because the local representatives did very little to help the local men who were arrested, to sort of limit the British response. And by the time you get to uh, 1917, uh, the by-election, it's very obvious that Sinn Féin sentiment is already very strong on Roscommon for this reason, and for the reason of land, as I mentioned. Your IPP took their eye off it, people wanted the land, the IPP wasn't fighting for people who were arrested in Roscommon and brought to British prisons. The IPP uh, MP in North Roscommon, Roscommon North, J.G. O'Kelly, had basically done nothing in 16 years. Now, it wasn't really his fault, he was very unwell, but he still was a placeholder sitting and warming a seat in Westminster. So by the time it came to uh, that by-election, it seemed like everybody, bar the IPP, knew that they were in danger. There were even newspapers in Britain that were reporting that the IPP was in danger. But the IPP didn't do much. They just decided, we go in with the same thing, we send up our land advocates, they'll vote the way they're told to vote, as they always have. And that didn't happen. Now, what 1917 was very important for nationality, that the first by-election was that it told the hardline Republicans that you don't always have to grab a gun 
and go to your, or to your enemy. Sometimes you can use politics. But people thought, there's no point in us trying to get Republicans elected. They thought that people weren't able for it. They didn't have the stomach for it. And there is an irony in some ways that was common. A quiescent county was the one that seemed to have the stomach for it. The elected Count Plunkett, he wasn't a particularly good MP um, or speaker. He largely was elected on the basis that his son was executed after Easter 1916. Um, but what happened there was it gave Sinn Féin, it gave Republicanism an idea that we can target politics, but then moved on to South Longford and May and various other counties and constituencies. And they knew then they could overtake the IPP, they could have a political approach as well as a military approach, approach to trying to gain Irish independence. Okay, John. So in your book, you trace the issues that are motivating people, people in Roscommon at this time. And amongst those issues are particularly partition, land, and then later on conscription. Can you explain uh, more about those? No. One of the big things with the IPP and a problem with them was that they tolerated partition. And even more so than 1916, partition disgruntled people in Roscommon. It's very strange. Even the RIC noted that, yes, Easter 1916 gave them a, a visceral reaction, but partition was almost like, yeah, this is just completely beyond the pale. It made absolutely no sense for Irishmen to be entertaining the subdivision of Ireland. It made no sense to me. So they thought the IPP weren't acting on the land. They wouldn't protect us if we were arrested. And now they want to take a chainsaw out of the country. So they thought the IPP were basically galloping away from Irish nationalism into the embrace of imperial imperial project, we put it that way, and people weren't particularly interested in that. Now, from 1917, you start to see Sinn Féin get a grip where the United Irish League, the grassroots organisation of the Irish Parliamentary Party, previously had a grip, that is to say, local agitation for land redistribution. So a lot of um, most common areas start to pop up Sinn Féin clubs, Sinn Féin branches, and of course a lot of this has to do with the, the beacon of light for Sinn Féin that was Father Michael Flanagan, who was exceptionally important in driving the long public support for this, because of course he was a priest, he was a curate, he was an exceptional speaker, even if you didn't like him, yet we're probably quite happy to listen to him. Um, but what you had there was this <laughs> very important build-up of the grassroots, which every political party that wanted to succeed nationally needed. So that's it's a very important thing that 1917, going in towards 1918, it seemed that the IPP were being pushed out, the United League were being pushed out, and you were going towards Sinn Féin. Now, of course, 1918, really, after four years of the First World War, you had a blow up on the land. The land has motivated just about everything about politics in North Common. And by that period, with the move away from the IPP, the war is too long, home rule no longer seems all that attractive because of partition. We're just going to go back to the land because they're not going to get it first. We better start taking it. So in 1918, you have a most violent uh, protest in Roscommon for a decade since 1907, 1908. So thousands mobilised, which is very interesting in that the Irish uh, War of Independence didn't see thousands of people mobilised or hundreds in any area except outside of land. So it's all in these areas that people very much want. It's supposed to force out those who have an excessive amount of land and take it themselves. And obviously a political vehicle is important for that, but not essential. Now, what I mean by that is simply when Sinn Féin said, yeah, I know you want the land, you better sort of settle down a little bit. People said, stop it, Sinn Féin, you come along for the ride or we leave you behind. So a lot of the thing in 1918 told Sinn Féin as well that, yeah, we need to look at the politics here, but the politics are all linked to the land. And it's how the IPP failed is that they moved away from it from after the third home Bill, but Sinn Féin very early got an education in Roscommon that yes, we will support you for an independent Ireland, but it's all about land. If there's a legislature in Dublin, if there's a legislature in Westminster, we're not all that bothered once it gives us the land. So while we often look at the Irish War of Independence as kind of a blossoming of Irish Republicanism, really when it came down to it in a lot of places, not just Roscommon, you had this very much uh, more practical desire. Compliments can be anywhere. The land is here. For us to live, we need it now. We need it local. We need it all sorted. So 1918, that was a big blow up right across the county. It was only really attenuated by the conscription crisis, which again, Sinn Féin took the lead. Uh, IPP tried to, but came across as kind of <laughs> disingenuous because they were main men looking for recruitment, all this kind of thing. So it almost sounded like they were getting on the same platforms and saying different things. 
Um, people didn't want that. So the conscription crisis solidified, I suppose, a Republican support, at least what appeared to be that. Now, some people joined the Republican bandwagon simply to get conscription off the field. They didn't want to join the British Army. They had no intention of dying in the trenches of France or anywhere else. A lot of the republicanism was very, uh, what do you say, uh, very pragmatic. All right, but uh, what you have from <clears throat> 1918, of course, is Sinn Féin not only doing conscription but recognizing that if we do this well, we can then aim for the general election. We can show them that we can mobilize nationally. We can show them the kind of support that we're going to give the people against the British. So you then come into 1918 December. I suppose it becomes very obvious that the IPP, the Irish Parliamentary Party, in what's common, have lost. Uh, pretty much they're ripped entirely. North was coming, there is no by election up there, or no election up there. Plan Comp Plunk could get the walk over. They can't, the IPP can't even get somebody to stand against them. They're that weak. Now, down in South Ross Common, where you have Athlone, which would have been, of course, a very strong IPP uh, area, you have John P. Hayden, who decides to go to battle against Harry Boland. Now, Boland had a Roscommon connection. He was, you know, grandfather was from there. He'd been with a number of more active Republicans in Roscommon for a number of years. But what you really have in South Roscommon is, despite the IPP uh, MP being a good politician, he was a good land man, he did like everyone else in the IPP, forget the land during the war, but he was as good an IPP politician as you want to get in the country. There's no two ways about it. And I actually, even when I read Hayden and look at him as a politician, you have to admire him. He was a good political maneuver, but he was out maneuvered, I suppose, by Sinn Fein. And uh, I suppose by not only that, but by Sinn Fein's manifesto and by their what seemed, I suppose, to people like Hayden as a, a fairyland type desire for a republic, they just thought it wasn't practical. Now, men like Bob Hayden, and that, I suppose, died in the world constitutionalists, they didn't see a route uh, that Sinn Fein or its supporters saw, however aspirational it may have been. So I suppose in Irish Party, up to 1918 general election, it took that really to get men like Hayden to understand how there were yesterday's men in Irish Party. You know, there were yesterday's men. So they had to go, basically. Now, um, one of the big things I suppose that's so much for Sinn Féin as well was when the priests came on board. It's very important. Um, if you didn't get the clergy agitating for you, chances are to be again yet. They would take a position, you know, they weren't going to sit on the fence. In South Ross Common, a guy called Cameron Cummins, South Ross Common Town was the most important. He was a big land man again, and he decided to jump in with Sinn Féin. He did not jump in with the United Irish League. No, it wasn't for any high-minded reasons, because the United Irish League wouldn't let him do what he wanted. If he got in there, he, of course, like a lot of these priests, wanted to get in and pull the wires. But he's cheating with them. And he was very, very effective, along with Father Michael O'Flanagan, in targeting the broader electorate, many of whom were much younger, far happier to be risky, I suppose, in their behaviour politically and in voting in Sinn Féin. So by the end of 1918, coming into 1919, you have this kind of a groundswell of, I suppose, the beautiful, and some might say, exuberance for the Republic, which, of course, then came into being in 1919 when Dáil Yeah. Yeah, I'll stop you there, sir. You just mentioned the formation of Dáil Éireann. So we've got this, this new parliament, this new republic, and you've got this counter-state that develops over nine, in various counties over 1919, 1920, and particularly in the county councils first, and then the Dáil courts that emerge. Can you tell us about that process in Roscommon? Yeah, now, it was a very slow burn. Um, obviously, the convening of the Republican government was one thing, but the Republic across the nation, in the counties, in the in the chambers, so to speak, was a different thing altogether. Now, the IPP still controlled a lot of the local authorities up until the elections in 1920. And it was very obvious because often there were sort of uh, symbolic votes for positions of interest, we'll say, to upcoming Sinn Féin politicians or political supporters. They always lost. But at the same time, as the year went on, it became obvious they were getting close, closer to winning. A lot of the IPP MPs or uh, local authority politicians recognised that the writings on the wall here, December 1918, told us that we're basically on, bor by, on, 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 on borrowed time. Now, a lot of them disengaged. A lot of the poor law guardians, especially in places like Strokes, down and that just stopped showing up. I thought there's no point. Um, you're not going to win either way. You know, you can't bother managing because whatever you do, you'll be said to be a crony of a dead and discredited party. And if you you don't show up at the very least, I suppose you can concentrate on your farm and uh, I suppose yourself enrichment. 
So the existing system is already starting to fall apart. It's starting to crumble. Yeah, yeah. They're just it, it's obvious. Um, some say that Ross Common Town Commissioners, only three men, or maybe four, turn up on a regular basis, and they just invariably spend the meeting bad mouthing Sinn Fein, doing not a whole lot of anything. And of course, that particular commission then has so greatly undermined itself in 1919 that it just collapsed in, in September 20, and that should to do a whip around in the town to get 40 pounds to light it because that's how little interest as they took in their job. It just undermined it almost completely. Now, 1920 elections came along. The first ones, of course, were in January. Now, Roscommon was a bit of a... There wasn't a lot going on there, um, really, in Roscommon town. All of these men who saw the writing on the wall withdrew. There were just enough nominees for the seats, so nine for nine. Most of them were Sinn Féin. Some of them said they were Labour, because a lot of these guys weren't stupid. They knew that um, you had to try and broaden your appeal a little bit. Sinn Féin was all about the public, but people, again, politics being local, wanted jobs, wanted, especially in small urban places like Roscommon, and that's where it's limited, I suppose, in what you actually can get to is agriculture or often the boat. So what we needed to do there was try and create some sort of a Labour base that might help, um, I suppose, uh, urban, urban workers um, have, a better, have a better lifestyle. In Boyle, it looked like it was going to be very interesting. There was 15 people going vying for the seats, but there was uh, an irregularity in how people registered, so they just re-elected the same guys. Now, a lot of them people disengaged entirely. Um, it looked, as I say, promising, but it wasn't. <clears throat> it really wasn't until the June elections that you actually get a little bit of interest. Again, most of them happened. Um, not uh, coincidentally to have a lot of equal nominees for equal seats. Again, Boyle was looked interesting until you know, some of the men in the uh, Republican side met a couple of those who wished to run against them and convinced them not to. Very often we're told with no shortage of intimidation. Again, in the south of Roscommon, that was something that was trotted out. Michael, Michael Pettit was probably the most interesting in that he couldn't deny his IPP um, pedigree. He was co-opted. A lot of the time the co-ops to these boards were seen as the real sort of the slave dogs. You know, they just been rewarded for their for their efforts. So he had a conversation. He was just told straight out, if you run, we're going to come around, we're going to shoot you. So he decided he'd pull out as well. There were only a couple of contests. Guys like Cannon Cummins threw their weight behind the Sinn Féin, threw them around even, uh, we're told, and just convinced people as they went into polling groups, you know what, vote for Sinn Féin. A lot of these other guys, no good. Now, <clears throat> there was one group that was coming up, the Irish Farmers Union. A lot of those, now, I suppose, were IPP men generally, were given the impression they were larger landowners, grazers, people with a bit more money and means. Now, there was a little bit more to them than that, but they were able to get one chap elected in Strokestown on the basis of uh, their numbers. Now, you're not talking about big figures. When did he get elected? 1920 in June. So this would be for, you know, um, poor law guardian seats and then for the county council. But the county council itself, 1920, uh, when it came about, was republic. That's what they said. Uh, they did all the things that good county councils did at their first convening. They repudiated the local government board. They pledged allegiance to Dáil Éireann. They thanked the IRA. They talked about the severance of um, skies with Britain, the, the public building it up and so on. Um, but of course, one of the problems with, uh, with an aspirational Republican came back to what happened on the ground. If you cut ties with the local government board, the British board that gave local authorities money, how do you run your affairs? You have a big problem. And that really did manifest in Roscommon. Now, some of them were very much, uh, you know, sacrifice for the Republic, but a lot of people weren't all that interested in that. The Athlone Poor Law Union, Oil Poor Law Union, they had an awful lot of difficulty. And you have to remember, these people were dealing with the destitute, the most impoverished, those who needed the most assistance. So when they were told, um, you know, just tell that family that it looked like they're literally on their last legs, they just need to suck it up for the Republic, that wasn't going to work. So a lot of these people, and it had to be acknowledged, dug into their own pockets to try and support some of these uh, Families, they look for loans on the basis of their own um, financial uh, wherewithal. But eventually, yes, Rowan and Boyle both decided, okay, we want to talk to the LGB again to get some money. And it wasn't good. The Republicans, those who were ideological, reckoned this was a betrayal. And it did sour relations. It undermined the political possibilities for a lot of the um, uh, more, well, the Republicans who were on, on these boards. And it had to be recognized that. Look, there has to be a different way. Uh, now, the rates were a problem. Uh, these boards would talk to the county council, the county council would give them 
a portion of the rates to manage their affairs. But the problem was that the rates weren't coming in because people thought, oh, I'm going to pay the rates uh, because, you know, but there's no government. Uh, and I don't recognize perhaps the people who are asking for the rates. I don't know where they're going. This is a, a Republican down the road and he might be using it to buy himself something nice. And there were problems with that, you know, um, the IRA had to convince a number of rate payers, rate collectors that uh, maybe they needed to get their their hands into their pockets and start helping the, uh, the, this new fledgling state out. But it's uh, very obvious, and it, this is one of the reasons that uh, Atlone and Boyle acted as they did, but even September of 1920, some of these bodies are on their, they're on their arses, you know, they literally have not a penny to their name, even the Trust Common Council sold a clock that they had in their their chamber because it looked nice and it got them 10 quid you know so a lot of the time people forget that in every war the sacrifices aren't just the lads who die in the fields and are shot against walls and very sacrifices are often the people who can't feed their families the people who have no homes all these things are sacrifices and the public wasn't built on the blood only of i suppose the man who shouldered the rifle it was often built on the suffering of the people who just didn't um but day to day their ability to live was greatly undermined by the by the battle we put it that way Okay, and apart from the slow dissolution of, of local government, you have the rise of the Republican courts, particularly from the summer 1920. So what's the story with those in Roscommon? As I mentioned, when it comes to Roscommon, if you do have a politician, he's land focused. If you have a court, it turns out that that's land focused too. A lot of the time, when the courts came into Roscommon, most of the plaintiffs, a lot of the issues were about land, intimidation, theft, but generally focused on landowners being intimidated by those who supported the Republic and wanted the land. Now, the big problem with that in 1920 was very straightforward. 1920 hosted the most um, severe agitation in Roscommon in 40 years. Now, if you were to look for the War of Independence in, in places like Roscommon and you wanted a war scene, go to a land uh, grab in 1920 around April or May, you'll see hundreds of people fighting the RIC, fighting the Crown Forces. All right? Now, it's not a pitched battle. It's not structured in the way that you might see, uh, obviously, on the, on the continent. But what you have is very obvious, I suppose, more so than even any of the other ambush tactics that would uh, uh, sort of typify the war from sort of July in, in Roscommon. It's, it's a very, uh, as one, um, even earlier in 1819, 1918, a fierce riot. These were riotous type events. So hundreds of people, a lot of young men who couldn't immigrate during the during the, the First World War stayed around, became radicalized, decided to put their minds to this, still wanted to land, their family needed to land. So this needs to be made, this needs to be uh, managed. Again, like in 1918, Sinn Féin were told, look it, hop on board or go we're off. So Sinn Féin said, what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and steer you towards an alternative. So in Roscommon, one of the first um, Sinn Féin directors were promulgated, five directors to try and limit the resort to violence because a lot of people in, I suppose, the height, the, the top of the Republican movement thought that this land agitation in places like Roscommon, Galway, Mayo, down to Tipperary, Clare was getting so big that it was actually distracting people from the Republic. And uncontrollable, maybe, yeah. Yeah, basically uncontrollable. Sinn Féin wagged the finger, people waved the finger back, you know, and it was very much like that. Even people like Michael O'Flanagan. He held a meeting. He thought he could use his gravitas and weight. By his next meeting, he was reassured, actually, you know what? No, not a lot I can do about this. So they needed a structured and solid alternative. The land courts for that. Now, when they came into Roscommon, Kevin O'Shea was probably the most um, prominent uh, judicial commissioner that operated in Roscommon. And he reckons between June and August of 1920, oh, about 11,500 acres in Roscommon were dealt with by him. Now, he, he would say, a lot of the local press would say, and of course, a lot of people on the Republican side would say that most of the accommodations that were reached were amicable. The problem was that to get somebody into the court very often, they had a gun put to their head, sometimes figuratively, sometimes quite literally. Uh, a lot of the people who owned the land, now some of them would be big landowners to be loyal and avert to come, and some of them would be, you know, uh, I suppose, multi-generational landholders of a lot of built up anger against them but it was very obvious that um, with the the absence of the courts it, the agitation would have become a problem the republic would have been under threat and it's certain i think that 
uh, even the RIC will admit that the, the courts themselves, well, they won't admit that the RIC didn't admit the courts did it, but they did register that the courts, shall we say, coming into being, and a diminution in agitation did happen around the same time. Yeah. So the courts kind of put a cap on the level of violence, land related. They did. What they did is they said, oh, they said that these people are agitating, look at this is an effective route. It's not an ineffective one like the one the IPP were saying. It's not a way to re give us the Republic kind of thing. People, the Republic was there. So people, I imagine, were pointing this out. Well, we've got a Republic. You've told us that it's coming to be, but we still haven't got the land. So they thought that's where your direction needs to go. So the land courts were exceptional in uh, reducing the agitation and then forcing people, it's supposed to focus on the fight for the Republic. At least some of them, the numbers of people who wanted the land and those who then went and fought for the Republic. It's, very, very different, hugely, hugely diminished, diminished in number. Just about the, the courts themselves. So if it did put a cap on the level of land-related violence, does that mean that people were generally happy with the, the judgments of the courts? Yeah, well, they were generally happy. Uh, look, at if you have such a long history of land enmity in a place like Ross Common, it's very obvious that something like that might, again, take it down by a degree, an order of magnitude, but it's not going to disappear. And even the Irish Free State, um, when that came into being, it still had to deal with land problems in Rothcommon, more Galway and Mayo. The West was a land problem area, you know, and cross land just had so much potential for changing the way people lived that it made sense that it had that kind of a grip. But it did limit, it didn't uh, eliminate, but it did limit it to enough of an extent that people were able to, as I say, focus on the war. There wasn't any great land agitation in Rothcommon from the start of the courts until uh, the end of the, the War of Independence. So it's to the remainder of the War of Independence and the violence within the county that we will turn in the next edition of our podcast series, the second part of my interview with Dr John Burke, author of Roscommon, The Irish Revolution, 1912-1923. to 1923. Thank you.